This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Today we are beginning a study of premillennialism. Lesson number one we have entitled The Millennial Mania. My name is Rod Rutherford and I'm going to be your instructor for this series of lessons on the important doctrine of premillennialism. There will be 15 lessons in this series and in this series we will deal with every major aspect of millennial thinking. We will examine it in the light of the Word of God. The word premillennialism needs to be defined here at the very beginning. Premillennialism comes from a Latin word mille, meaning thousand, and the Latin word annum, meaning year. So you see, thousand years is involved. The prefix pre has to do with the fact that they believe that before the millennium or the thousand years, Christ will come. The ism simply means that it's a teaching or the doctrine of. And so premillennialism is the doctrine that Christ is going to come before the so-called millennium upon this earth. We talked about the millennial mania. The word mania means simply an exaggerated or irrational craving, an infatuation or a madness. And I believe today in the world we have a millennial madness Anyone who listens to television preachers or radio preachers or reads much of the religious literature will know that this is indeed the case. Premillennial preachers on radio and television fill the airwaves with predictions that the return of the Lord to rule on this earth for 1,000 literal years, the millennium is rapidly approaching. Even now, they tell us, the time is very near. Many premillennial books have hit our bookshelves and our bookstands. Uh, they have very dramatic titles, frightening titles sometimes, such as The Late Great Planet Earth, Shock Waves of Armageddon, The End of the Age, and 2001, On the Edge of Eternity. In addition to all of these books and these sermons on radio and television, there are a number of tracts and lectures which uh, contain statements that tend to fill the timid soul with fear. You read that times are getting worse and worse, that events in the Middle East are building up and leading toward Armageddon. You read that the European common market is paving the way for the coming of the Antichrist. And even El Nino is said to be a contributor to the signs that the millennium is very near. Truly, I believe we are in the midst of millennial madness today. Because of all this teaching, because of all this sensationalism, because of all the speculation that we're hearing from so many preachers and some of them very respected preachers in their particular denominations, many sincere Bible believers are troubled and frightened. They really wonder what is going to happen. They wonder if the end is indeed near. Others may not be troubled or frightened, but they're certainly confused by the deluge of premillennial thinking that is being propagated upon the public, and they really don't know what to believe. And so we are studying this subject at this time in order to help enlighten people on what the Bible actually teaches about these things. We hope that by our study of the Word of God together that we can learn that premillennialism is not according to the Scriptures. And we can see why it's not according to the teaching of the Word of God. And so that's going to be our aim in this study. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, the Apostle John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And the Apostle Paul admonished us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21 to test all things and hold fast that which is good. And so that will be our aim in this study. We're going to look at the writings of prominent premillennial preachers of our day and 
of days gone by, and we're going to put them to the test, the test of God's Word, to see if what they're teaching is indeed true. Now, the first point that we want to consider again is, what is premillennialism? What is premillennialism? Now, the only time that the word millennium is found in the Word of God or the reference made to a thousand years is in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And so the doctrine of premillennialism has Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6 as its focal point. But there are actually three views of the millennium or the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20. These three views are called, first of all, premillennialism. Now that's simply the belief that Christ will return in order to set up His kingdom on this earth. Premillennialism is the belief that Christ will return in order to set up a kingdom on this earth. And He's going to rule over that kingdom from Jerusalem for 1,000 literal years. And so that's the doctrine of premillennialism, which will be the focus of our study in this series. But then there's also the doctrine of postmillennialism. Postmillennialism is the belief that things are getting better and better as a result of the preaching of the gospel. It's a belief that this will result in an age of peace and prosperity on earth, the millennium, and then the second coming of Christ will occur at the end of the millennium. And so postmillennialism is the belief that things are getting better and better, and this is because of the influence of the gospel. This will result in a golden age of peace and prosperity, the end of which Christ will come. And then there's the doctrine of ah millennialism. Ah millennialism. If you have ever studied New Testament Greek, you know that the alpha or the a in front of a word negates it, makes it negative. And so the doctrine of ah millennialism, or some say a millennialism, is the belief that the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20 are figurative. Ah millennialism is the belief that the thousand years in Revelation 20 are figurative. They're not to be taken literally, and the meaning probably is that it simply refers to an extended period of time when Christians are relatively free from persecution and uninhibited in spreading the gospel throughout the world. Now, of these three views that we've mentioned, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism, the most popular view today is certainly that of the premillennial view. Premillennialism is estimated to be believed by perhaps as many as 85% of those who claim to believe in the Bible as the inspired Word of God. Those of us who do not accept the premillennial ideas are very much in a minority today among those who profess to believe the Bible. Now, according to premillennialism, several things must take place before Christ can come back. According to premillennialism, several things must take place before our Lord can make His return to this earth. First of all, there are going to be wars and earthquakes and famines and other disasters of a severity not seen before in the history of the world. The first thing will be there will be numerous wars, earthquakes, famines, various disasters, storms, of various kinds of a severity not seen before. Now, in our news media today, we read often of earthquakes and floods, of typhoons and cyclones and tornadoes. And we know these storms do take a heavy toll around the world. Are we having more today than we've had in the past? I doubt it. We simply have a better reporting of these things and a greater awareness today than we've ever had before because of the advanced means of communication. But then a second thing that premillennialists tell us that must take place before Christ comes again is that the old Roman Empire is going to be revived. Can you believe it? The old Roman Empire that perished a long time ago, in fact, it ended according to historians probably in 476 A.D., but according to premillennialists, it's going to be revived in Europe. 
Now in Europe today, there's a movement toward unification in trade known as the European Common Market. There are presently 12 nations who make up the European Common Market. Premillennialists say that the 10 nations of the European Common Market will uh, result in the revival of the Roman Empire. And then that in turn will pave the way for the coming of the Antichrist. A great world ruler will arise called the Antichrist, so the premillennialists tell us. A great world ruler, a very evil man, is going to come who will be the Antichrist. He'll be a man of great personality, of personal charisma. Uh, he will be able to move multitudes. He will not only be a political figure, but he will be a religious figure. But he will be the embodiment of all that is evil. And premillennial writers such as Hal Lindsey suggest that even now the Antichrist is alive and making his preparation to come to power. And then another thing that premillennialists tell us that must happen before our Lord comes back to earth again is that the Jews will return to Palestine. The Jews will return to Palestine where many will be converted to Christianity the temple will be rebuilt and the Old Testament sacrificial system will be restored. Now we know that many Jews went back to Palestine after World War II particularly and we also know that on May the 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was recognized in modern times as a nation among the family of nations. Premillennialists usually make a great deal of this in fact, one of them, Hal Lindsey, in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, suggested that within a generation from the time that Israel became a nation, May the 14th, 1948, and he went on to uh, tell us that a generation in the Bible was about 40 years. He said in 1970 when he wrote that book that within a generation from the time that Israel became a nation, the kingdom would come, the Christ would come. We would see the end of all things of this present world system. Well, uh, from 1948, if we take uh, Lindsay's definition of a, a generation being 40 years, that would bring us up to 1988. But friends, 1988 has come and gone, and we have not seen the millennial system instituted upon this earth. And then there's another thing that premillennialists say that must be involved before Christ can come back. Well, actually, it involves the first stage of His coming. You see, premillennialists believe not just in a second coming of Christ, but they ha actually have about three comings of Christ. His first coming to die for our sins, and then His second coming has two phases or two stages. The first stage is when He comes for His saints, this is called the rapture, the rapture. True believers, they say, will be secretly and suddenly caught up into heaven. And we've all seen the bumper stickers that say, in the event of the rapture, this car will be driverless. And they talk about, speculate in their books, the great confusion that's going to prevail on earth when Christ comes for his saints in the rapture. And then the rapture, is going to be followed by the Great Tribulation, the Great Tribulation. And it's believed that the Great Tribulation will be a time of intense persecution on this earth. The Jews are going to be converted during this time by um, the thousands. Great multitudes of them will be converted. You see, the saints have already been raptured up into heaven with the Lord for seven years. And on this earth, the Jews are going to be converted, but the Antichrist, is going to persecute them severely. And that will be the great tribulation, the most intense period of suffering and persecution that has ever been known on the earth. And then that's going to be followed finally by a great battle. That great battle is known as the Battle of Armageddon. And we often hear about the Battle of Armageddon. It's believed that the Battle of Armageddon will take place, at least the central part of the battle will take place on the plains of Megiddo in the land of Palestine, a place where in ancient times many great battles were fought that determined the outcome of nations and the course of history. 
And that great battle will involve the Antichrist and his forces, including many of the nations of the Western world, against the kings of the East, great hordes of the Chinese people, and their allies will fight there. And so these are things that premillennialists tell us must take place before Christ can come and set up his kingdom on this earth. Now, he's going to come in time to determine the outcome of the Battle of Armageddon, and that's called the Revelation. That's phase two of his second coming. But also, according to premillennialists, several things will take place after Christ comes back. According to premillennialists, several things will take place after Christ comes back. Uh, first of all, they believe that Christ will come at a crucial time. He will come just in time to determine the outcome of the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is going to be waging fast and furious. Uh, the forces of the Antichrist pitted against the forces of the kings of the east. It will have as his focal point Armageddon, the plains of Megiddo, but the war will actually be a world war. It will be World War III according to premillennial writers. But Christ is going to come just in time to intervene and he will destroy all the forces of the Antichrist and all of the other armies and he will take control of the earth. And then having done that, another thing that he must do after he comes back is that he will rule the earth from David's literal throne in the literal city of Jerusalem for a literal 1,000 years, the millennium. He will rule the earth from David's throne in Jerusalem for 1,000 literal years, and that's known as the millennium. Now, the millennium is going to be a wonderful time on this earth, according to premillennialists. I have in my files somewhere a newspaper that a premillennialist put out many years ago, and it's, of course, not an actual newspaper, but it's purported to be the first edition of a worldwide newspaper that came out after the beginning of the millennium. And it contains these fantastic stories about how there's a wheat harvest in Russia that is a thousand times as great as ever been known, that there is fruit that is produced that is much larger than any uh, fruit that has ever been seen before, that people are not getting sick anymore, uh, that uh, bald people are getting new heads of hair and people who don't have teeth are growing new teeth and the deaf are able to hear again and the blind are able to see and the death rate has gone way, way down. Peace is going to prevail throughout the entire world as the world submits to Jesus Christ and the earth itself will be restored to the conditions that existed in paradise when God first created the earth. People are going to live extremely long lives because uh, disease will be conquered and death will be almost unknown. In fact, premillennialists tell us that a man who's a hundred years old will be considered much as we would consider a ten-year-old child today because a hundred years will not be long at all for a lifespan. And so all these wonderful things are told us about the millennium. Christ ruling on the earth from David's actual throne in Jerusalem for 1,000 literal years. But the millennium will only last for 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, exactly to the day, if we can follow the premillennial timetable, the millennium will end because at the end of the millennium, Satan, who has been incarcerated, in the bottomless pit will be released. At the end of the millennium, Satan will be released from prison. Now, the millennialists, for the most part, premillennialists are Calvinist or believe in some form of Calvinism. And a part of Calvinism, as you may remember, is the fact that man is believed to be born with Adam's sin on his soul. The old doctrine of inherited sin or the doctrine of hereditary totally depravity. That's a view, not true according to the Bible, but is commonly held by premillennialists. And so they teach based on this that even though in the millennium Christ has reigned and 
righteousness has prevailed on the earth for a thousand years, yet that old sinful nature is still in man. And so when Satan is released at the end of the thousand years, he's able to take advantage of that, and he's able to stir up a large following of mankind and begin one last final rebellion against the Lord. But in that final rebellion that he leads against the Lord and the Lord's righteous rule, the Lord will soundly defeat him. Satan will be soundly defeated, never to rise again, never to make trouble anymore. He will be cast into hell, the lake of fire, and then according to the premillennialist, the final judgment will take place and there are several judgments as there are several comings of Christ in premillennialism. But this particular judgment is called the great white throne judgment. And it's believed that that is the judgment mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. The great white throne judgment will, be, will take place and then eternity will follow. Eternity will follow. The righteous will be made immortal and would dwell in new heavens and a new earth. Now, some premillennialists simply say the new heavens and the new earth will be this old earth that will be renovated by fire, and uh, it will be made new, uh, new at least in, uh, in kind, if uh, not in, or new in quality, if not in kind. But there are others who speculate that uh, there's going to be something like a space city that hovers above this earth, and that will be the New Jerusalem, and many of the immortal saints will live there. Well, what I have just gone through now with you is, is the most common premillennial approach. Uh, that is the general form that premillennialism takes today, particularly dispensationalism. However, the number and sequence of these events that I've gone through may vary a little bit. With, uh, from one premillennialist to another and from one religious body to another. Of all the premillennial religious bodies, you will find some variation. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a form that is different from that that is generally held by Baptist and other conservative Protestants. The Seventh-day Adventists have a form that slightly varies too in many aspects from that of the Jehovah's Witnesses and also that of the Baptist and others. But these, this is the gist that I've given you of the premillennial program. Now let's notice premillennialism has troubled God's people since ancient times. Premillennialism has troubled God's people since ancient times. Do you know there is nothing new under the sun? Solomon said that long ago, didn't he? And it's certainly true. And it's true when it comes to false doctrines. One of the marks, I believe, of the inspiration of the Word of God is that God was able to program in His Word teaching that would in every way answer every false doctrine that man would ever come up with unto the end of time. Man will never come up with any false doctrine or idea or heresy, but what we can find and answer for it in the inspired Word of God. God already has foreseen what man's going to come up with, and he has, if you please, pre-programmed the answer to that false doctrine in his word, if we will but search his word. And so premillennialism has troubled God's people since ancient times. It's not a new doctrine. It's been refuted in the past, and it's still being refuted today. Millennial ideas actually were held by some of the Jews as much as two centuries before Christ came to this earth. And you can find in the writings of the ancient rabbis of various premillennial ideas. After Christianity came, after the initial golden age, if you please, of Christianity, during the time that the apostles were alive and the gospel was spreading throughout the world, after that time, false doctrines began to creep in. And one of the false doctrines that came in in the second and third, third centuries was what used to be called, and was called in those days, Chileasm. Now, Chileasm is simply another word for premillennialism. It comes from the Greek word Chileos, which means 1,000. 
And this troubled the church for a while in the second and third century. In fact, you can find some premillennial heresies troubling the church in almost every century uh, from the second century up until the present. But this became a major problem in the second and third centuries and as a result was refuted by the so-called church fathers, the great leaders in the church in those days whose writings have come down to us to uh, some degree. Uh, the church in the East widely rejected premillennial ideas. In the West, it had more of a hold, but finally in the uh, uh, fourth and fifth centuries, the great writer Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, whose writings have come down uh, virtually intact from his day to ours and who's regarded as one of the greatest theologians of all times. Augustine refuted premillennialism and perhaps it was to his credit that premillennialism was not a major factor facing the churches until fairly modern times. Now when the Protestant Reformation came along in the 16th century, when men such as Martin Luther and John Calvin and others challenged the papacy and broke the power of the Church of Rome and I gave back to men the right to read the Bible for themselves. These men studied the millennial ideas, but both Luther and Calvin were amillennial in their thinking. Both Luther and Calvin were amillennial in their thinking, and that is important to remember. Many premillennialists today highly respect Luther and Calvin and follow the teachings in other areas, not knowing that they were opposed to premillennial ideas. There was a man by the name of Daniel Whitby who made postmillennialism very popular among Protestants for many years. Daniel Whitby made postmillennialism very popular. Whitby lived in England from eight, uh, rather from 1638 until 1726, and he wrote widely. and His readings were or his writings were widely read, and he had a great influence upon Protestants for more than a hundred years after his time. But now we want to turn our attention to a specific form of premillennialism. And this specific form of premillennialism is called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism became popular in the 1800s. In the uh, 19th century, the 1800s, dispensationalism became very popular. Now notice concerning dispensationalism these facts. First of all, dispensationalism is a form of premillennialism which teaches that all human history can be divided into seven successive ages. Dispensationalism teaches that all human history can be divided into seven successive stages. Now, Dispensationalism teaches that these seven successive ages correspond to the seven days of creation. We know that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. And dispensationalists tell us that each one of these days of creation corresponds to an age on this earth. They say the first day of creation uh, refers to the age of innocence. The age of innocence when Adam and Eve were created and were without sin until the fall. And so the first day, day is the age of innocence which lasted from creation to the fall. We don't know how long that period of time was. The second day refers to the age of conscience. The age of conscience which lasted from the fall to the time of the great flood or through the time of the great flood. And so that would be uh, Genesis, the material covered in Genesis chapters 4 through 9. And then they say the third day is the age of human government. The third day is the age of human government which lasted from Abraham up to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And that would be the material in our Bibles covered from about Genesis chapters 11 or 12 going up to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Genesis chapters 9 up to chapter 12. I'm getting ahead of myself. The fourth day is the age of promise. 
And that lasts, the age of promise lasts from Abraham to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. I need to go back and correct something here. The third day is the age of human government which lasted from the flood to the time of Abraham. And then the fourth day is the age of promise which lasted from Abraham to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And that's Genesis 12 through Exodus 20. And then the fifth day is the age of law. That's when the law of Moses was in effect. That lasts from Sinai to Calvary to the time that Jesus died on the cross. The sixth day, they say, is the age of grace. That's the period in which we presently live that began at Calvary when Jesus died on the cross and it will continue until the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom on this earth. But what is the seventh day? Well, you remember God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. Well, the seventh day is a period when the earth will be at rest. That will be the millennium, the age of the kingdom. And so the seventh day is the kingdom age which will last from the second coming of Christ to the end of the millennium when eternity will begin. Now, friends, there are many things wrong with premillennialism. There are many things wrong with dispensationalism. But here are two major things that are wrong with the dispensational division of the earth's history. First of all, they base the idea that one day, a day of creation can equal a period, an age, uh, on 2 Peter 3, 8, an erroneous interpretation of that. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, you remember that the apostle Peter, in speaking of the second coming of Christ, said, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. They take that to mean that a thousand years is always equal to a day, and they take it to mean that one day, a 24-hour day, can represent an age, and they use it to represent an age. Well, Peter didn't say a day was a thousand years. He said a thousand years is as a day. What he was simply trying to say was that time doesn't count with God. That was a point that he was making, and that was the only point that he was making. The second thing wrong with this dispensational division of the earth's history is that all these ages based on days are purely arbitrary. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches this. This is not a result of exegesis of the Scripture. It's a result of asegesis, where one reads into the Scripture a preconceived idea. The Schofield Bible is a dispensational Bible. That is, the notes in it are dispensational notes. And it sets forth these ideas, and it, more than anything else, probably has made them popular. But there are two premillennial preachers today who are primarily responsible for, for, for the form of dispensational doctrine that is so widely believed. And these two premillennial preachers are, number one, John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby is the father of modern dispensationalism. Now, that's a very important fact to remember. John Nelson Darby is the father of modern dispensationalism. Darby lived in England between 1800 and 1882. He was a lawyer by training, but he was a member of the Church of England and became involved uh, in the Church of England. He became opposed to it because of its uh, organization, because of its complexity, and because it had lost its spiritual fervor. And he became one of the founders of a religious body that today is known as the Plymouth Brethren. But he is really today the father of modern dispensationalism. Then another very prominent man in this period of time, uh, or a little bit later, was C.I. Schofield. C.I. Schofield popularized dispensationalism, perhaps more than Darby or more than any other up to his time. He was a lawyer and a politician who became a minister in the Congregational Church in the last century. And uh, he wrote a book, a small book, I have it in my library, called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. This book came out in 1888. 
and it sets forth premillennial ideas, but in 1909 he came out with his Schofield Reference Bible. And this reference Bible has probably done more to spread dispensationalism than any other book except for the books written by our contemporary writer, Hal Lindsey. Now, as we come to a close of this first lesson, we want to notice there are several other prominent points of premillennialism. There are other prominent points of premillennialism that we will look at in lessons to follow. Number one, premillennialists allege that God did not fulfill all the land promised to Israel. They say God did not fulfill all the land promised to Israel, that all of Palestine must be occupied before a kingdom can be set up on this earth. And we'll study this more fully later. But this accounts for the fact that premillennialists are really pushed for the government of the United States to support Israel in all that they do. It, in, it affects our politics and the stance of many of our politicians. And then another prominent point of premillennialism is that Christ came the first time, they say, to set up his kingdom. But he failed to do so because of the reaction of the Jews, because the Jews rejected him. When the Jews rejected Christ, then Christ was unable to set up his kingdom. Instead, they say that he set up the church. The church was just a temporary measure. It was a spiritual contingency. Or as Brother R.H. Bull, a premillennialist in the Church of Christ said, it was simply the vestibule of the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. It's the entrance into it, the vestibule of the kingdom. They teach that Christ is coming again, coming the next time, to set up his kingdom on this earth. He couldn't do it the first time because of the rejection of the Jews, and so he's coming again to do it. Now, there's several things wrong with premillennialism. Number one is it, in effect, makes the first coming of Christ a failure. Number two, it casts reflection upon the omnipotence of God suggesting that God didn't have the power to do what he intended. It also casts reflection upon the omniscience of God and suggests that he did not know the right time to send his son in spite of the fact that Galatians 4, 4, and 5 tells us that Christ came when the time was right. And it makes the church of Christ a mere afterthought in spite of the fact that Ephesians 3, 10, and 11 tells us that the church is a part of the eternal purpose of God. And finally, another major point, prominent point of premillennialism is that it makes Revelation 20 the focal point around which all the rest of the Bible is to be interpreted. It makes Revelation 20 the focal point around which all the rest of the Bible is to be interpreted. Well, we have introduced premillennialism and talked about the millennial mania we will continue our study of the millennial mania in the lesson to follow this one. We hope all of you will want to join us in that study, and we hope that you will find it both interesting and also very helpful to you as you live the Christian life and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to others.